Lauren Becker Macius is a poet whose work has appeared in a number of journals, some of which include Salamander, Third Wednesday, Mudlark, Boxcar, Poetry Review, and more. Lauren is also very busy as program director for Mass Poetry, which is a poetry outreach organization for Massachusetts that provides programs like Poetry on the T, professional development, student development, common threads, readings, and more. She's here to share some of her own poetry today and also let us know through her bio that she lives in Boston with six plants and one wicked awesome husband. So with that, I would like to welcome Lauren Macius. Um, these first two poems I wrote um, on Martha's Vineyard at the Martha's Vineyard Writers Residency. So if you've been there, you will um, know a lot of the scenery. And if you haven't, hopefully they make you want to go. Underside. If you sit here long enough, you'll notice lights in the trees. You'll remember the wood at the harbor, how it was everything that wasn't water. You'll envision the woodpecker by the pond holding itself to the underside of a branch, grazing almost, unsure where to peck, several false starts. Or maybe a pattern with which it will break the branch from the tree, a pattern you didn't catch repeating. You'll think about your past, a place you never expected to not want to visit. The men you loved like drunken vineyards, the women like sand storming your eyes. You never expected to exile yourself from yourself, but visiting flattens you into the wind roving map of an island. Oh, thank you. Usually with poetry, we do clapping all at the end or after everyone. What do you prefer? Um, at the end is lovely. <laughs> thank you. It'll go to my head otherwise. <laughs> Um, when you feel longing. But when you feel longing, there is somewhere to go. The tall grass flecked with ticks, searching with their legs for yours. The boardwalk made of leafless trees, staring all day at the full water, not at their own reflections, but at each wet molecule, together creating each wide wave, and each small fish curving its black body above the sand. When you feel longing, you are not a bride, not a bridge, not a bird, not a burrow hole, not a cave. You are a mountain, raised over years and years of your own listening. When you feel longing, you are the seafloor. You are the blind gossamer fish grazing it. Its whole life, one dark moment waiting for something to pass by. And that gossamer fish will reappear later. I love the ocean and I love those crazy deep sea fish. Um, and I promise these will not all be landscape poems, but this is another one. And um, I'm really inspired by the landscape and, um, and about disappearance and appearance, and those seem to go together um, for me quite a bit. And this is inspired by the Colorado landscape, which is sort of my home base. It's called Wild. In the last clouded sky, you hold three tulips with two fingers. You say goodbye to the sun. You watch it creep below the water, the hills, the big boxy railroad car full of you don't know what. Three deer run past, almost at your feet, and you yell at them to stop, but they are wild and run faster because you are wild too, just an animal standing upright, holding what you're too poised to eat. Suddenly the heads of the tulips, the bright red mouths are gone. Suddenly the clouds are eating the stems. Suddenly nothing is in your hand, cupped now in the shape of what it used to hold. Um, this next one I wrote, that's the end of the sentence. I wrote it, no. Um, <laughs> this next one I wrote, it's fairly new and I wrote it this July at the Vermont Studio Center where um, visual artists and writers come together for a residency for time and space to write and I'm very <clears throat> inspired by visual art and um, I write a lot in images so I sort of wrote this poem wishing that I could paint and it's sort of what I would want to try to paint if I could. <clears throat> 
and for now it's called watercolor. Take this apple, I will make you a mouth. Slippery tongue, strong teeth, lips to fatly press on its skin. The sun is an orphan considering, considering. The moon backs away from our hands. Take this bouquet of yellow roses I cut from the bush. A clay bust will appear that I will hollow out and fill with water. The scraps might become whatever you're imagining them to be. An ear, an elm tree, a bridge over these rocks, over the river. Anything but the river itself. Anything but your soul. It's in the pocket of every pair of discarded jeans. Take this thimble. Take this thread. Um, this poem I wrote on my walk home from work, which is about a 25-minute walk, and that's the most fun when it's snowing. Um, and it was this day, and I was listening to a podcast of a poet, and um, you'll hear in the first stanza what he had to say, and this poem is sort of my response. It's called Dear Directness. The poet on the radio says he admires directness and avoids statements of emotion because they feel false. I feel annoyed, seems to be both, and I promise is true. The trees are indifferent and look less cold than us. The bus looks very cold. Its accordion torso plays itself quietly, weaving the salty metal ends through wet Boston air like a fish I surely, by a minute, won't catch. Evening drifts predictably over my marriage, and it's starless everywhere but in this room, in this city. Um, this next poem is called The Stag's Note, and it is what I think a stag might leave in a note after he eats my tulips. <laughs> <laughs> the Stag's Note. He said, longing isn't love, isn't a barrel of something aged, seeping into something aging inside its old wooden curves. He said, after it's been done, you'll glow like you've been lit, but have the scent of a candle just blown out. And you will finish the round walk, he said, heel meeting toe, meeting toe, slow, contrived, like your slim fingers steadying a red glass of wine. He said, moonrise is a deer no one wants in their yard, but the guest who hushes the family, her finger to her lips. It's a weird note, but <laughs> um, he'd probably just say thank you. But um, this next poem is about, you know, burritos, which are to me what tulips are to a deer. I love them. They're everything. Um, it's called My Heart Belongs to Qdoba. If you don't know what Qdoba is or haven't been there, it's similar to Chipotle. And if you don't know what Chipotle is or haven't been there, you should go to either one of those. It's giant burritos, and they're amazing. And that's advertisement over. This is called My Heart Belongs to Qdoba. Once a lady sweetly said, I have a weakness for flowers. And I wish I had a weakness so romantic, but mine is for burritos. From the place where you stand in a line against a counter and tell them that, and also that, and the verde one, and some cheese. And that's a difficult thing to admit to yourself when even your future, your 30s, begin to take shape inside the charcoal corners of your brain. And they look like a hand pulling a red wallet from a purse and handing a credit card to a pierced cashier and solemnly lifting the bagged burrito and cradling it delicately under one arm. <laughs> Okay, this next one, I think I have just four more poems. And I got a little out of breath on the last one, so I might be in trouble. Oh, this poem is um, my longest poem, but because that might sound scary, and sometimes when someone's reading a long poem, I think you think like, when will this end? I could enjoy it if I knew. So I'm gonna show you. <laughs> <laughs> It's just on the top of that second page. <laughs> so hopefully we can all rest easy. Um, <laughs> and the fun part about reading it is that it's all one sentence. 
so it's a doozy. Bear with me. And the title is also the first line. It's called, Only in my dream you were. Only in my dream you were. A deep sea squid with neon tentacles becoming a chandelier, gallantly casting a blue hue on minuet dancers, one of whom you slowly became as she drank from a thin champagne flute filled with a small fern until her peep toes became the open mouths of two eels coiling their oily bodies around light poles illuminating the street on which you were born. All the sleeping windows sprayed with aerosol snow in the shape of your voice, a flimsy circle that doesn't quite meet. Those circles becoming the irises of daisies coating a field wild with what sprouts and crawls, tame with daisy after daisy, a flower I once handed you not in a dream, but in a glass-walled room at the tip of a silver skyscraper the day before you stepped off its roof becoming the pinch of song a finch sings and the branch on which it sings it each leaf clean as a newborn, the cloud above it an ancestor holding a talisman, which appears in my dream as a cameo made of crushed conch shell, until the thin neck breaks like a wave I am riding inland and I wake as soaked in seawater as if I were the fish I always worried I'd become. Its translucent skin one slick curve with no eyes to nestle, just a mechanism for putting off light or feelers that reach far into the darkness against the cool bottom. And I do become it, I'm sure, the way you told me in the dream while you emptied a red purse of a grooved cherry stone, coaxing from it an oratorio, then slid it, shut loose as a dreaming eye, down your throat while you waited, while you emptied your fern into the fountain next to you, as it filled with coral and soil and two deer, one of which you became, while also being the man standing before it, feeding it crab apples from his cupped hands, which I think were supposed to be me. <laughs> I made it. <laughs> um, so I just have three more. Am I okay on time? Yes. Okay. Um, this poem I wrote actually for a contest, a samsara poetry contest, um, that asked you to write a poem on the theme of the used this quote, from that which came before to that which comes next. And that line will come up in this poem. And this is what I wrote for that and then promptly forgot to submit it. <laughs> uh, so I'll just read it to you. It's called Lineage. Through belly rise, she becomes her mother and her daughter. She becomes a basket filled with the curved spoon of a question mark. Her body is a Model T by Tuesday, a covered wagon by Wednesday. By the weekend, she is a wheel carved from stone. She sees a foot in her sleep step out of a woman's body to become a woman creating a woman from her body. From that which came before to that which comes next, the caterpillar whispers from a leaf in a jar. When the time comes, her mouth drops open like a drawbridge, and from it swarm a thousand tiny voices, singing lullabies in the languages of her blood. And this next poem, um, and I just have two left, is also a prompt poem. And the prompt for this poem was to write about the form and technique of your own poetry. Um, and the way that the prompt was written, they um, said, write about the form and technique of being Andrew Mitchell, like, or whoever you are. So the form and technique of being Lauren Macius. Um, and the only thing you need to know for this poem, if you don't know it, is it mentions Arnold Daniel. And he's the creator of a poetic form called the Sestina, which features a lot of repetition. And so um, it's, um, a poem used a lot for um, things that are very circular and hard to come to a resolution, grief, loss, and that kind of thing. So, so it's called The Form and Technique of Being Andrew Mitchell. Wait, I have a feeling that's not me. So I put together some words, then rearrange them, and as something starts to form, I look for myself all the parts, the ones here typing and the ones grown and lost. If I repeat some things according to the way Arnaud Daniel did, I will get lost in the echo of my hogtied emotion, but I may start to know my voice as I go. 
Hey, I recognize that rock. If I free myself like Whitman, I'll swim the vast oceans like a whale, alongside a whale, singing with the whales, nursing my calf, watching her swim. Will you record our repeated songs, our mating songs, our rhymes? Play them loudly underground in your basement, speakers pressed to the walls. Play them there like cradle songs to the mute still bodies of the dead. And it's my last poem. Thank you for listening. Um, this is very new, and um, I probably shouldn't read it, but I think it's good to scare yourself a little. Um, so, um, yes, it's very new. I don't know what will happen with it. And um, currently the placeholder title is the beginning of the first sentence, which is, everything has been canned, so to speak, slowly, well, that's relative, floated across the globe, sucking in its proverbial stomach to skirt the Panama Canal. Now we can live in the same cans, you're right, they're boxes, for 65K plus installation. At least we'll know the cans a little more intimately, watching the journey end for one right in our literal backyard. Every commodity has stacked inside the primary color container, stacked upon container, upon container. All I can think about, that's a lie, is unpacking when they dock. All I can think of, see, is our monstrous scale. There's hardly a simile for it. So big we live inside pieces of it. So big we can't step back, our fingers grazing our chins. The whole Sinyak, how would we feel? Would our post-impressionist blotches blur into something we recognize or become themselves the whole Pollock, the canvas we pock and streak and love, that special lump where we've hidden a nail next to a cigarette, and we'd think back fondly recalling the impression the canvas made in the grass, our collective body craned over it, creating. Some would have it put behind class, no photos with flash, 24-hour security, and that would be smart. But all so many of us can think, with a quick glance over our shoulders, is how might the brush strokes feel on the tip of my finger? Thank you. So thank you so much, Lauren, thank you. for coming out here and sharing your poet self. We often uh, mm -hmm. see you uh, for the great work you do for community. Thank and you. it was really special to have you here sharing your poetry this morning. Mm -hmm. And just wondering, uh, as we're trying this out, if we have any questions uh, from the audience about the poetry read, uh, the process of writing, uh, the intersection of life and being a poet. There's one in the back. Do you have a favorite word? A favorite word. A favorite word? Hmm. Oh. <laughs> I don't think I have a favorite word, but right now I have a phrase from a poem stuck in my head that's like my favorite thing right now, which is from Kevin Young's Ode to Chicken. And it's, even your unmanicured feet taste sweet. <laughs> <laughs> and I've just been walking around for about a week just saying that in my head. Well, there you go. <laughs> Great first question and answer. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. How long have you been writing? I've been writing since sixth grade. Um, my mom found a bunch of things that I had written and thought, she, what she told me was, I think you'd be a good country songwriter. <laughs> um, and then she looked up some places that I could kind of get more into writing. So I went to some writing summer camps in sixth grade. And, but strangely, I didn't know that there were contemporary living, breathing poets until college. Which so, is why I do the work I do to broaden the audience for poetry. Can you tell us what poetry is in your own words? Can you repeat that? Yes, the question is what poetry is in my own words. Um, I mean, to me, I think poetry can be so many different things, and that's what I love about it. It's not the same thing to every person, and, um, and I love that it doesn't need to be. Um, but I think that what 
the best poetry is and does for me is evokes a feeling or a sense that someone else has felt and that I otherwise wouldn't have felt that day. And um, it's also, I think it's unique in the literary arts in that um, you don't need a lot of background knowledge or context or even narrative to get that feeling that someone wants to convey in a poem. That's what it is to me and what I love about it. Have time for one more question? All right, I, I was I was wondering um, how, uh, how is writing poetry, how does it go for you with all of the work that you do mm -hmm. for mass poetry? Mm -hmm. Where do you find time and inspiration? That's, sometimes I ask myself the same question. <laughs> um, so, um, no, I think that it's, I'm always inspired through the job that I do at Mass Poetry. Um, and I'm never without the reminder that I need to be working on <laughs> my own poetry. Um, so I do, it's often in our slower times, which are kind of the summer months, um, that I have more time. But I try to wake up um, a couple hours before I need to be doing anything that day. And um, do something poetry related. If I say I'm gonna wake up and write for an hour, I'll kind of stunt myself. So I'll just say wake up and spend time with poetry. So that's reading or writing or reading things that will inspire me. And I try to get some sort of drafting done in that time. Perfect, you tie in right with our title, right beside yes. you there. Oh, yes, that is what I do, yes. Uh, so thank you very much yeah. for q and <laughs> They were from the days when a well-set table, like a mother in pearls, was admired down to the last glint of the salt spoon in a country they never spoke of by name. The old country, where their parents sang as they prayed and danced as they sang and sobbed as they left with their silver wrapped in dish towels. Meals stewed on kitchen stoves, brisket and potatoes, rich as nobody's business, could only be settle, settled with seltzer, no meat with milk. The kitchen was the workshop of these women grinding special cuts in the hand grinder, chopping fried liver and onions with one boiled egg in a wooden bowl. Chickens simmered with carrots, celery, parsnips, strong soup to cure cold or chill from the child, or the stranger the child was told not to talk to, told blood is thicker than gravy. Set your place among these women whose hands were intricate, wrinkled like the countries they came from, or thick as a good suit bought in New York for an afternoon like this, to visit a neighbor's neighbor who made it big in the garment business. These women who sewed, these women who seldom drove, they owned linen tablecloths and good dishes in Cologne, played canasta in Miami Beach, and were married to heavy drinkers who sold textiles on the road. Women who laughed at their husbands' jokes but kept extra money hidden among their girdles, who believed in aspirin and peppermints, saved safety pins and rubber bands in old <coughs> kitchen tins, and wearing floral house dresses, kneaded and rolled out dough on flowered countertops women who faithfully made from scratch. Can you hear the guitar? Yeah. To see her bobbing on her tiny bowed legs fills my heart with joy. And the looks that she shoots me with her big brown eyes are so coy. 
When the sun glistens off of her butch red hair, there go all my inhibitions. Yeah, it's devil may care. She's my high, strong, low riding, saucy little dachshund dog. <laughs> When she sees the paper boy, she goes raff, 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 raff. <laughs> and when the male person comes, she's going raff, 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 raff. <laughs> when those Bernese Mountain dogs go sauntering by, they don't even dare to look her in the eye. She's going raff, 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 raff. Well, it couldn't be easy to have legs so short on a body that's the normal size. With a brain thinking she should be the master of us all, so go on, saucy. Dogmatize, and she goes raff, 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 raff. Cause she's my high, strung, low riding, saucy little dachshund dog. When those office politics start getting me down And the boss is acting meaner and meaner I've got the best kind of therapy in town I go on home and I stroke my wiener <laughs> And she goes wag, 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 wag Cause she's my high, strung, low riding, saucy little dachshund dog. She's my wiener dog. Yeah, she's my high, strung, low riding, saucy little dog.